Hi, this is Larry Mantle, host of Air Talk on KPCC. Since the start of the coronavirus pandemic, we've had a daily segment on Air Talk devoted to the latest information about COVID-19. As time's gone on, we've looked at vaccines and how the virus and pandemic have affected the lives of Southern Californians. That includes doctors, nurses, epidemiologists, and other medical professionals fighting the virus on the front lines. In each episode of this podcast, we'll speak with one of our experts on the rotating panel of AirTalk guests. They'll be sharing their expertise with us daily. You can also listen anytime at las.com kpcc.org or subscribe wherever you download podcasts. Joining us right now, uh, as he has every week since the beginning of this pandemic, close to two years ago, from UC Davis Children's Hospital, where he's chief of pediatric infectious disease and professor of medicine at UC Davis Children's, Dr. Dean Blumberg. Dr. Blumberg, very good Monday to you. Good morning, Larry. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Good to have you with us. I want to begin, first of all, with with what uh, hospitals in the UC Davis system are dealing with right now, because uh, down here it's been very rough on hospitals. Uh, a number of them have stopped um, doing elective procedures or surgeries, short staffing because so many hospital personnel have called in with positive COVID tests or with symptoms. Uh, what are you dealing with up at Davis? You know, the same thing. It's a double whammy, really, because on the one hand, many healthcare workers are affected by infection. Also, the vast majority are being infected in the community, just like patients are. And then they're out. Thankfully, you know, the workforce is, is mostly vaccinated. So the vast majority of these illnesses are mild, but people are out while they're um, infectious. And then there being there are increased number of admissions due to COVID and complications from COVID. I've been trying to schedule for a family member an elective procedure at at UC Davis, and I I can't even get a call back. I just assume there's not even enough office staff. You know, things are delayed. Hopefully you will get a call back soon. But yeah, the office staff is, um, many of the office staff are are hit with this also. And things are are delayed. Things that normally would have a same day call back are being delayed 24, 48 hours, and sometimes even longer. Have you suffered a loss of any personnel because who who left rather than get vaccinated, who just didn't want to do it and and didn't want to meet the mandate? Yeah, at several hospitals, I've I've we've had some pe- people who d- did not want to be vaccinated. You know, the interesting thing is that the vast majority of them left and they were like at retirement age and they just re- decided to retire. So, you know, it's almost as if this just pushed them over the edge. You know, the because of the mandatory vaccination, because all the hospitals in the area are requiring it, and because CDPH is requiring it, the California Department of Public Health, it's not like a, a doctor or a nurse can say, I don't want to be vaccinated and get a job at another hospital. They're going to need to go out of state to somewhere like Idaho or somewhere that doesn't have those kind of regulations. So there's not a lot of options. Well, and, and those have to be many of your most experienced people if they're close to retirement age. You know, some of them are close to retirement age and some of them just have, you know, have had it and just want out for other reasons. But um, the vast majority of people are staying in their positions. It's a very, you know, it's, it's a stressful time. But, you know, you can also imagine that it's a very rewarding time to be in healthcare because there is such a need and, and really, really do feel like we're, we're helping people. So chance for you to ask questions of Dr. Blumberg. And remember, he's a pediatric infectious disease specialist. So you're if a parent, if you're a parent with a specific question about COVID-19 and particularly returning to school after the holiday break, we're at 866-893-KPCC. You can also ask it via email, atcomments at kpcc.org. Please include your location and your first name. Also, I just want to remind you to please not ask what are very individualized questions that's best uh, asked of your your health care provider. That's the better way to do that. Um, better for us to have questions that would be applicable to more than just yourself with your question. 866-893-KPECC. Um, 
Kitty in Monrovia emailed us. I want to ask about the seemingly random nature of recent Omicron infections. I've been seeing situations where two vaccinated and boosted individuals are at the same event, similar exposure. One gets it, but not the other. What are the reasons for that, Dr. Blumberg? You're absolutely right. We're seeing a lot of that. And, you know, some people who are doing everything right still manage to get infected. And that's because the virus is so incredibly infectious. Remember that Omicron reaches concentrations of over 70 times that of previous strains in the upper respiratory tract, and then the several mutations um, do make it more infectious and more transmissible to others. So even if you're generally socially distancing, even if you're masking when you're around others, the masking um, helps to prevent disease, vaccination helps to prevent disease, but vaccination isn't 100% effective against breakthrough infections, and the masks aren't 100%. Even the N95s, they're 95% in terms of their filtering capacity. Um, The good news is that the vaccines continue to provide robust protection against serious infection. So that's infection requiring hospitalization. And that's why we're seeing that these breakthrough infections, most of them are mild and outpatient. But there is a lot of biological variability with some people getting infected and others not, even when they're in the same situation. Well, I remember early on in the pandemic, there was the thought maybe blood types played into it. Um, We saw many more um, serious symptoms with men than women, for example, and there was speculation about why we would see a gender difference like that. It would hit men harder. Um, Is there anything like that now that we can point to? Obviously, immunocompromised, but, but that wouldn't be so obvious. Yeah, you know, there's other things that that make small that make small differences, and maybe you add them up, and they could add up to a real difference. Things like wearing glasses or any kind of eye protection um, is is associated with less transmission because some transmission may be through the um, through droplets getting in the eye. So there's these very small differences that that can be demonstrated on a population level. And if you add them up for an individual, it may make somebody at at a little bit higher risk to get infected. Uh, And you anticipated a question from Andy and Dustin wondering about, given the potential for exposure through the eyes, what sort of eye protection would you recommend? Yeah, so for healthcare workers in California, the California Department of Health is recommending eye protection, and the eye protection would be something that starts at the forehead and goes down to where near where the mask is, and really provides a, a tight a tight seal. So more of a goggles type situation, or you can have one of those face shields, the plastic face shield that goes from the forehead all the way down to the to the chin. Those are what's effective. The ones that are less effective are the ones that are more just light glasses, like safety glasses, for example, that have large gaps on the side and don't wrap around. Those probably provide some protection, but not as much protection. And do we have a sense of of how um, many cases are likely through eye exposure? Is that possible to determine? Because I'm sure for a lot of people, it's well, I'm already wearing an N95 or KN95 mask. Do I want to throw on a face shield on top of that or goggles or whatever? You, you know, is, is it really looking Looking at the risk benefit, um, worth that? Yeah, is it worth it? That's 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 the question, you know. And then they end up getting fogged up also because you're wearing the mask and all the air goes up. So it is it is annoying. I I admit that. And the studies suggest that the eye protection provides about twenty to thirty percent of protection. Um, versus not wearing eye protection. So that is a significant level of increased protection that some people may choose. All right, 866-893-KPECC. Jacob, in the Mount Washington District of Northeast L.A., asks, what's the timeline for when we can expect a vaccine approval for kids under five? Yeah, so remember those those studies were just reported recently and the vaccine looked like it worked very well in children six to 17 months of age, but the immune response was suboptimal in those 18 months to four years of age. They're using one-tenth the adult dose and in the preliminary studies, it looked like that was the right dose. 
but the two dose series was suboptimal in, in that age group. So back to the drawing board and you could either increase the dose of the vaccine or add an extra dose and the manufacturer decided to add an extra dose. So they're trying a three dose primary series in that group. And we do expect to have results in the next couple months and likely uh, availability in the first quarter of this year. So maybe March. All right. Drew in Claremont emailed us, we're seeing a lot of symptomatic people in line at our local school district testing sites. Given the limited amount of commercially available tests, wouldn't restarting the county's free drive through testing sites take pressure off of school districts and hospitals where people are showing up for tests? Yeah, you know, there's a variety of of safe ways to do the testing. One is to have the people primarily be outside and line up outside. Drive through is another good strategy. And I guess it just depends on the resources that are available and the personnel. There's so many people um, that work for government, that work for healthcare, that are affected, that I'm I'm just not sure that there's enough personnel to restart those those testing sites. And I don't know if you would uh, know the answer to this question. Uh, Sandy in Redondo Beach emailed to ask, um, financially, for people who are hospitalized for COVID, uh, how much do they typically end up being responsible for? Do you know, Dr. Blumberg, is this covered as any other sort of hospitalization would be under someone's insurance? Yeah, I think so. I think it just depends on the insurance. But, you know, that's insurance is the one thing in healthcare that's always remained a, a huge mystery to me. So, yeah, I guess it would depend on what your deductibles are, what co-payments are as the hospital and network, all those kinds of moving parts to health insurance, which would come into play if you were hospitalized for any other condition as well. 866-893-KPECC. You can also email us at atcomments at kpecc.org with your question for Dr. Dean Blumberg, UC Davis Children's Hospital. Um, Here in L.A. County, we have some of the most stringent COVID-19 rules. We have a relatively high rate of vaccination, and yet we're seeing our COVID rate particularly high compared to other parts of the state. Now, part of the rate may be a factor that maybe there's more testing here than some of the other counties. Um, We're seeing kind of a middle of the pack hospitalization per 100,000 rate. So so what's your thought about um, the differences we're seeing county to county here? You know, one of the things that we saw early in the pandemic is that urban areas were affected earlier on when when the COVID outbreak occurred and then the rural areas that would be introduced into those areas a little later. And so we'd see it there later. So we do expect that when there's a new strain, when there's a new variant like Omicron, that it's going to hit the cities first, the more populated areas, the more concentrated um, counties first, and then it's going to get into the more rural, less densely populated um, areas. So the the rate in LA County is extraordinarily high. It's it's about 10 times um, higher than the surge that occurred last winter. Um, and, and yet, even though we're seeing all those cases that are occurring, the hospitalization rate is much lower. Um, and that's that's likely because it's a, um, a less virulent form of, of the virus, but also because it's a highly vaccinated population in LA County. And that does result in the breakthrough infections being relatively mild. 866-893-KPECC. You can also email us with your question at atcomments at kpecc.org. Please include your location and first name. Mary in Pasadena says, is it clear which medical conditions, uh, you know, pre-existing conditions, make a person more susceptible to severe cases of COVID? Well, certainly that patients who are immunocompromised are going to be more susceptible. Any kind of weakened immune system, obesity um, has has been there too. Things like any chronic underlying disease that's significant, so significant um, lung disease, heart disease, um, kidney failure, um, all those have have been borne out just to increased risk of 
of severity of disease. You know, somebody who's got, already got lung disease, if they get COVID and they get lower respiratory tract infection or pneumonia, that's going to be a more severe pneumonia. It's going to be much more difficult for them to maintain their oxy- oxygenation without supplemental oxygen and support. It does seem, though, with the, the Omicron variant, that the percentage of cases that get into the lower respiratory system, into the lungs, and then potentially uh, spreading, it doesn't seem to be as great as with with Delta. Are, are, are you seeing that anecdotally? Oh, definitely. You know, the laboratory studies had had predicted that because the virus has 10 times lower concentration in lung cells um, compared to um, previous strains. And so it does appear to cause less lower respiratory tract disease. And for example, the last surge that we saw in pediatrics due to Delta, the admissions were due to teenagers who ended up getting pneumonia, bad pneumonia, ended up in the hospital in the ICU requiring uh, being placed on respirators um, and and other oxygen support. Um, What we're seeing now is we're seeing more complications of more upper respiratory tract infections, things like croup or bronchiolitis, um, a wheezing that occurs in toddlers. And so we're just not seeing the same sort of disease that we saw with previous variants. And and so I was wondering, by extension, the pre-existing conditions that you mentioned that put someone at greater risk of, of having more serious COVID, are they less in play with Omicron because of, of the, on average, less involvement of the lungs? I think they're still in play with with Omicron because although a lower percentage will have lower respiratory tract infection, um, at least in adults, there still are significant number of patients being admitted to the hospital with pneumonia due to due to COVID. All right, 866-893-KPECC or AT comments at kpecc.org. Please include your first name and your location. We might have heard late last week, Governor Newsom announced he's activating the National Guard to bolster California's capacity to test for COVID-19, that because of the personnel shortage Dr. Blumberg was just talking about. The governor is also in his January budget proposal um, making an ask of the legislature of $2.7 billion for response to COVID-19. We've seen another daily record with more than 45,000 new COVID cases in L.A. County yesterday. Remember, of course, COVID case case is a fairly blunt instrument for determining what's going on because um, who gets tested and the the overall number of tests is so highly variable. But what we're seeing with hospitalization, of course, is is very uh, positive compared to Delta. Nevertheless, hospitalizations are going up and hospitals are feeling that stress as their personnel uh, has suffered as a result of people calling out sick with COVID-19 or testing positive for COVID. Uh, We're talking with Dr. Dean Blumberg, UC Davis Children's Hospital. We're at 866-893-KPECC. Dr. Blumberg, we get so many questions about the at-home antigen tests for COVID-19. When are they best used, and what are their strengths and limitations? So the the at-home tests are good. They're very good. And they're good if you do them for asymptomatic people with repeated screening. And they're good for symptomatic people if they turn positive, because there's very few false positive results that occur. So if you're symptomatic and being screened and you get a positive result with that home assay, that I, I believe that. If you get a negative result, it's not quite as sensitive as the PCR assay. So somebody who's symptomatic, you wouldn't want to miss that infection. And so the recommendation would be to, to follow that up with a PCR test. Um, where they, they also are good is for testing people to see if they are continued infectious. And this is something that the CDC recently made a recommendation for to decrease the, um, the amount of isolation time. The PCR tests are so positive that they stay positive for, for weeks to months even, even past when people are infectious infected. I'm sorry, infectious to others, whereas the antigen tests do correlate well with decreased infectivity of people. So that's how I see them fitting in a positive in somebody who's symptomatic, 
I'd, I'd believe that a negative and somebody's symptomatic, then then you'd, you'd want to back that up. Holly in the city of Orange said um, you were just talking about uh, Omicron affecting the lower respiratory system less than Delta. But I've uh, seen studies that suggest Omicron is uh, leading to increases in type 1 and type 2 diabetes among children who've had COVID-19. Uh, and so wondering, well, how, how you know, if you're not seeing as much involvement of the lungs, how does the pancreas get involved and then with diabetes? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And this has been seen with other viral respiratory infections that sometimes they seem to trigger onset of diabetes. And so the theory behind this is that there's two ways that this could happen. One is that the virus itself infects the pancreas and, and somehow causes diabetes by causing that insulin deficiency by the affecting those cells. Um, another way is that there's some sort of autoimmune type reaction, some sort of cross reaction and inflammation that occurs due to cross reaction with the response to the virus that then the body itself attacks the, the pancreas itself. And so it's believed the latter is probably more likely that's occurring, um, that it's just sort of collateral damage from the body's own immune system fighting off the virus. All right. When should people go to either urgent care or an ER to be seen with COVID symptoms? We've unfortunately seen many ERs overrun with people coming in to get COVID tests, not because they're actually seriously ill. So what should be the threshold for leaving your house, uh, going to an urgent or emergency room care facility? The number one reason that people will need medical care due to COVID is because they have um, pneumonia. And so anybody who's having difficulty breathing, anybody who's like turning blue around the lips, if they're breathing really fast and and you suspect they're not getting enough oxygen, you know, that's, that's a reason to certainly a reason to go to urgent care, go to the emergency room because that person might need supplemental oxygen. The second most common reason would be for somebody to feel so sick that they're just not taking in enough fluids and they're getting dehydrated and they might need intravenous therapy. And then the other reasons, there's a whole host of other reasons that people might need to go in due to other complications from COVID. And so if you have you know, consistent fever that's not going away or other symptoms that aren't being controlled, like headache that's not being controlled with usual pain medication, those are other reasons to seek medical attention. If someone tests positive for COVID who um, is or isn't fully vaccinated, maybe the advice is different, um, and they're asymptomatic, what, what should they do? Should they isolate themselves? What, what's the recommendation? Yeah, certainly somebody who tests positive should should isolate themselves, whether they're vaccinated um, or not. Those who are unvaccinated and not boosted, um, you know, they, they should really stay isolated for at least 10 days. Those who are um, isolated and boosted, um, you know, they, then there's options to get testing later in the course, like at five to seven days, and then maybe decrease the isolation by, by but continue to mask until that 10 day mark. So that's the advantage of being um, vaccinated um, and boosted is that there can be shortening of that isolation. And can you do it with that at home test after, say, five? to seven days you can do it at the at, with the at home test and that is the antigen test and that's the test that's going to correlate better than the pcr test with whether you're infectious um, or not um, as far as being out and about and returning to work you know different employers are going to have different policies so you'd have to check with your organization we're at 866-893-kpcc you can also email us at at comments at kpcc.org dr blumberg uh, what are your thoughts it's about uh, schools like in Los Angeles uh, now mandating that kids, even when they're outdoors, have to wear masks at all times unless they're in the process of eating. In Chicago, of course, we've seen an impasse between uh, the mayor's office and the teachers union, which has led classes, I think, for four days now to not be held at the, the restart after the holiday break. Your thoughts on, on you know, what to what extent should schools go uh, to to require that kids mask or be separated? 
We know that it's safe for kids to mask as young as down to two years of age, and children are very resilient. They can learn the rules as long as they have consistent expectations. So certainly it makes sense for them to mask well indoors. And if they're outdoors and they're not physically distanced, so for example, if they're congregating together at recess, it just makes sense um, that although it's decreased risk of transmission, there's still risk when they're that close to each other. So if they're not distancing, it, it's, it's prudent for them to continue masking while they're outdoors. Steffi in Thousand Oaks says after someone has contracted the Omicron variant of COVID-19, how likely are there to be reinfected? And we've seen, for example, people with previous variants of COVID have, in some cases, multiple infections. Yeah, we expect the immunity to be very similar to previous variants, which is that you're unlikely to be reinfected within three or four months of infected. It's possible, but it's not likely. And then after that, immunity will wane and people will be um, then susceptible to get reinfected either with the Omicron variant or you know, potential new variants. Brenna in Huntington Beach wonders, if you're fully vaccinated and boosted, does that reduce your chances if you do get COVID of having long COVID symptoms? We don't, we don't know that yet. We know that people who are vaccinated may get long COVID. We know that people who are vaccinated are less likely to get infected in the first place and so have a lower rate of getting long COVID. But if you do get a breakthrough infection, we just don't know if vaccination then results in, in less chance of developing long COVID. Nylon and Redondo Beach says, are we seeing a trend of mutations becoming more contagious but less severe? Um, I'm wondering if, if we can see, if we're likely to see this trend post-Omicron. You know, I don't know that I would count on that. It's possible, and that would be that would be great if the if every new strain had um, was less severe, caused less severe infection. But I think that with so much transmission that's occurring, you can get additional mutations, and you could get uh, additional mutations such that you could have a highly transmissible strain that had the virulence factors of Delta, for example, and that caused more severe disease. So I, I guess. I'm, I'm, there's 24 letters in the Greek alphabet, so we still we still got more to, more to learn about COVID. Dr. Dean Blumberg, UC Davis Children's Hospital, with us. Trini in Culver City asks: um, Are there different degrees of being immunosuppressed? Um, if I'm on a low dose of medication for being immunocompromised, am I at less risk for severe COVID than someone, say, is receiving infusions or on a very high dose of immunosuppressing medication? Yeah, certainly. So you can imagine somebody who's more severely immune suppressed. So they've had a bone marrow or a solid organ transplant, somebody on extraordinarily high dose of biologic modifiers or steroids, and they would be very immune suppressed and, and prone to severe disease. And then people who are on lower doses, maintenance doses, for example, of steroids for asthma or for other reasons, or had some sort of mild immune suppression. And this, these are the kind of things that hospital systems, healthcare systems, that's what we worry about is trying to prioritize those because, for example, there's um, limited um, availability of the monoclonals that work against Omicron, like so Trovimab um, and the Paxlovid, the, the antiviral. And so we need to create these tiers of patients who will be at highest risk and will benefit most from these preventative therapies. We understand that uh, surface transmission of COVID is less than airborne, but Darren in Los Angeles emailed to ask, how long does the virus potentially last on surfaces? Yeah, so the vast majority of cases are transmitted by the respiratory route, and there's a theoretical risk of transmission from surfaces, but a whole series of chain of events need to occur. The virus needs to be at a high concentration on that surface and remain viable. Then you need to touch that and then pretty much immediately touch you know, a mucous membrane, put that finger in your mouth, your nose, your eye, somewhere like that to inoculate yourself. And we just don't know that that really occurs. 
I'm not aware of any additional information about survival on surfaces of Omicron compared to previous variants, but certainly depending on the surface, the virus can be detectable um, at, at, uh, anywhere from uh, a few hours to a day or longer. We just don't know that, it, that detecting it uh, means that it's transmissible from that surface. For uh, parents who are thinking about, you know, birthday or other parties for their kids, what's your advice on on having parties? And and you know, should parents be much more cautious now because of Omicron and particularly down here, how much of this, how much of it there is? I think in people who are fully vaccinated and boosted, I'd feel much more safer getting together. I think any large gathering, I'd be more reluctant even when people are fully vaccinated and, and boosted. Um, I think if kids are less than five and they're not vaccinated, I, I think now would not be the time to um, get together. I think that does pose to higher risk. And of course, there's a caveat, which is everybody has different risk tolerance. So even with fully vaccinated and boosted people, they may not want to get together until this wave is over. And the good news is that the models suggest in California and in Los Angeles that that we're at or near the peak of number of days of transmission, of number of cases that are occurring of the daily infections. And of course, we expect the peak of hospitalizations to be about five to seven days later. Um, but then things should start quieting down. Ivy and Altadena emailed us wondering about the extent of risk uh, for vaccinated kids uh, contracting COVID at school and potentially bringing it home. If I recall correctly, the cases of COVID in schools typically were through community spread at home, not through the spread at school. But you know, what are we seeing with kids starting to get vaccinated? Yeah, we're, I, I'm not aware of a lot of school outbreaks that are occurring. So schools continue to be safe places for children to be. There's little transmission in schools when a household ends up getting transmission within the household. Normally, it's the adult who brings it into the household and then transmits to the kid. So theoretically, there is a risk of your child getting COVID and bringing it home. But because the schools, most schools are having the policies that consistently require the children to be masking and exclude children who are, are sick, um, schools continue to be safe places to be. And are, are social gatherings, does that still seem to be the primary spreader that it was early on in the pandemic? Or have we moved into other areas like, you know, going to restaurants or gyms or the supermarket that have that have now become sources of significance? You know, any, any of those situations may may cause transmission within the community. But what we're hearing is many cases are traced back to social gatherings where people are unmasked. So many of these social gatherings are gathering for drinks or for meals where people wouldn't normally mask. Um, and then we're, we're getting transmission in those settings. Thank you so much, Dr. Blumberg. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. And we offer to you and, and your colleagues at UC Davis our very best particularly getting through this difficult time where staffing is so short. Thanks, Larry. Stay safe, and I'm think, I think we're getting there very soon. All right, sounds good. Dr. Dean Blumberg, professor of medicine at UC Davis Medical Center and professor, uh, chief, excuse me, of pediatric infectious diseases at UC Davis Children's Hospital. Thanks for listening to this episode of COVID in LA. If you'd like to stay up to date with the latest coronavirus news, you can listen anytime at las.com, at kpecc.org, or subscribe wherever you download podcasts. See you next time and stay safe. I'm Larry Mantle.